be maybe two others that would be that day for work day to, to do it. And, but you, God always got things done. And, and it's, that's why he's so faithful, even for the little things. The little things. Amen. Them. Amen. Well, good morning. Welcome back to Calvary Chapel Inland, Evo 30. Amen. I am back from Africa. My name is Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us today. So I have been gone for the last two weeks. Good morning, Diana. I haven't seen you in church lately. Of course, I haven't been here for two weeks. <laughs> uh, so I'm back. Um, as I said, I was in Africa on a missions trip. Over there was blessed out of my socks. Um, one thing that was very encouraging. Good morning, Patty. Saw you on Sunday, Patty. Um, was encouraging was when I got there, almost immediately, uh, the guys that came to pick me up all said, oh, we've been watching your, uh, your videos on Facebook. I'm like, what videos? The Devo 30. I'm like, really? <laughs> so again, in Africa, that's, that's awesome. Uganda, they were watching uh, these devotions. So I must be doing something right. Yeah. It's hard to tell sometimes. Now, that told me a couple of things, that there are people watching these videos, but they're not liking them. I'm not saying they don't like them. They're not putting that little like button. Yeah. And they're not uh, actually viewing them. They're just scrolling through it and then listening to it. You can do that on Facebook without actually pushing the, the button. So though I have about three people watching and I see that, <laughs> there's probably a lot more that are really watching. Uh, I was told the opposite. If you get 100 views, there's probably maybe 10 that actually view the whole thing, which isn't um, too good. But if you have 100 views, you probably have people watching uh, that aren't clicking on the video, so you probably have maybe a lot more than that. I don't know what the percentage is. So, But anyway, that was, that was encouraging for me to see uh, over there in Africa that people were watching, and I get that every so often. So I guess the Lord is telling me to continue on with my Devo, mm -hmm. And so I'm going to do so. So today we stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And if you'd like to join us, love to have you here at the church at 9 a.m. in the morning before maybe you take your kids to school or before you go to work and you like to just fellowship, pray, and seek the Lord together, then um, you, you're more than welcome to join us here. If not, you can view our videos on Facebook. They're also on YouTube. So if you go to our YouTube Calvary Chapel Inland, you'll find all our videos there from the past three years that we've done through the New Testament. So uh, maybe we'll go through the Old Testament one of these years and <clears throat> see how that works out. Haven't done that yet. So if you are in the neighborhood, like to join us, we're at 5383 Martin Street in Harupa Valley. <clears throat> Today we're going to continue to go through the book of Hebrews and we'll be in chapter 4. Chapter 4. So I encourage you, if you are watching this, to actually open up the screen and at least like it. Love to see how many people are actually watching besides 35, 40. And I know I've been gone for a while, so people aren't expecting me to be on again. So uh, share this on your wall or do a um, watch, what do they call it, a watch something, party, party watch, watch party, party, and get other people to, to join us. <clears throat> and I simply just go through a chapter every time we... We meet together and try to um, expound upon the scriptures that we are reading at that moment. So let's go ahead and pray and ask the Lord to minister to us this morning. Gracious Father, thank you, Lord, for bringing me back home safely, Lord, but also bringing me home with uh, new insight, Father, to my own personal relationship with you and also to the church that you have here. Uh, Lord, in, in Harupa Valley that you've entrusted to me, Lord, for the past 25 years, Lord. <clears throat> and Lord, just a different view of America and the world, Lord. Uh, you have really ministered to me this time, Father, uh, through the lives and through the area of South Sudan, Lord. And I'm appreciative of that, Father. And Lord, this morning we want to just thank you for getting us up. Thank you for being faithful to us, Lord providing for us our daily needs, Lord. And we just look forward to what you have for us today, Lord. Uh, many of us will be busy doing uh, little odds and ends, paying bills, uh, running errands, taking care of kids. Just help us, Lord. Help us to rest in you, Lord. Though there's work to be done, there's still a rest that we can find in you. 
when we put our faith and trust in you, Lord, that you're working all things out for good. Uh, Lord, so help us to understand that this morning, Lord, as we look at Hebrews chapter 4. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Good morning, Moses, from India. So Moses, uh, he actually gets on there and lets us know he's there from India. So thank you for doing that, Moses. Appreciate it. Debbie, all the way from your mobile unit. <laughs> Not very far. All right. Anyway, enough joking. So let's get into Hebrews chapter 4. Um, this chapter is dealing with with rest, as I, as I pray, just simple rest. And I'm not talking about <clears throat> resting when you go to bed at night, you know, and you let your body uh, go through the whole restoration process that it's supposed to go through at night while you're sleeping. That's when your body heals from the day before, all the aches and pains or any chronic illnesses. It, it's constantly healing daily. And in fact, they say that your body actually uh, rebuilds itself every seven years, you get a new body. And of course, as you get older, you get an older new body, you know, <laughs> with its aches and pains and wrinkles and things like that. Uh, but I'm not talking about that kind of rest. And I'm not talking about going to the beach and laying down and going, oh, good, I can just rest from my labor and so forth. This is a different kind of rest that God uh, gives to us uh, in a spiritual rest that we can find in Him for our daily struggles and needs and the daily work that God has for us, uh, the projects, uh, the, the, uh, the work in the kingdom of God, whether you're in missions, whether you're in ministry, there is a daily rest that we have and it's a rest that, that God gives to us just like he rested on the Sabbath day from all of his work. So this is a spiritual rest, it's a spiritual peace. I would probably call it more a peace that we get and it's a rest that we have while we're doing the work. And we see this with the children of Israel, just to give you some background here. We see it with the children of Israel uh, and we'll see it again this coming Wednesday when we get into Numbers chapter 19, I believe it is. <clears throat> uh, the children of Israel were promised the promised land. God said, I want you to take it. Uh, it's already been done before the foundations of the world. He has given it to them. But when they got to that place, uh, they didn't go in because they feared. They didn't trust God. They did not have faith in God. So they didn't go into the promised land and find the rest that God had for them. They ended up wandering in the wilderness for 40 years until that whole generation was gone. And by the way, the question is, and I've heard it asked before, were those people saved? It doesn't say, uh, but chances are, and from what I read from the scriptures, they probably were not saved. And so none of them entered into the rest of God. And we'll see that today. They were probably the ones that we read in Luke about the seed that's planted on the different soils. That they were experiencing the gifts of God, the works of God, but they never really were rooted in God. And of course, when temptations and trials came, it just washed them away. And those are people that are not saved. And Hebrews talks a lot about those people. We'll see later on about those who have tasted of the Lord, those who have seen the work, but yet they've fallen away and they're unable to come back. So those are those that uh, have experienced God in a religious sense. They've gone to church before, uh, but they're no longer really fruitful, nor are they going to church. And so those are the ones that aren't rooted deeply and they need to get rooted deeply they need to repent they need to turn back to God and they need to do works fresh works that show uh, that their salvation is set and having the fruit of those works in their lives so he's talking about that rest that they didn't have now the rest that they were supposed to have as they entered in again you, you look at and you read the promised land and what Joshua did when he finally entered in it was a battle it was a constant battle and fighting and taking over of nations and claiming the land and the promises of God. It was a constant battle. Yet, God said there's a rest in all of that. So what kind of rest is, is, is God talking about? It's, it's the rest and the peace that we have in God that, that first, He's our God and He has a plan for our lives. And that plan includes pain and suffering. But yet, there's a rest that we have in knowing that we're in His hands and that he is directing us and guiding us, even if that is unto death. And that's a rest that I saw in South Sudan and these military chaplains that, that I was training, not necessarily the ones that were new, but some of the older ones, the peace that they have. 
even though knowing that they are going to certain areas where they're going to risk their lives and they may die. They just have this peace about them. Let that be the Lord's will. If that's what the Lord's will is for me to die, then I'll die. And absent from the body is present with the Lord, Amen. they would say. And there's a certain rest and peace there when you have faith uh, in God in those areas that God will get you out. Just like the children of uh, Israel, uh, the three Hebrew boys, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, they wouldn't bow their knee to Nebuchadnezzar or anyone else, but only to God. And there was a rest in their life, a peace in their life, that even when they walked towards the furnace, they knew if God decides to take us, he'll take us. And, and, and we're going to go home, you know. Uh, but if he wants us to endure through that, then let us endure through that. And there's a rest and peace there. Uh, we see it also in um, many of the other patriarchs. David also when his child died. And that child was through sin, and it was a repercussion of his sin. Uh, but when the child died, he was mourning, he was praying, he was fasting while, it, while his child was sick. But as soon as his child died, he got up, he brushed himself off, and he went back into uh, serving the Lord because he knew that his child was in heaven. And there's a rest and a peace there that so many people don't have because they really don't have the faith in God, knowing what God had said. I remember when I got saved and the question came up of my uh, relationship with God in my own mind and in my own thoughts, my relationship with God compared to my religious relationship with God through Catholicism. And there was a point in my life where I thought, have I done the right thing? Because I've been uh, born into Catholicism, was raised in Catholicism, and kept the sacraments as best as I could, which wasn't very good. But, you know, this was the church that I grew up in. And all of a sudden, I'm doing this completely different within Christianity, trusting in the work of God. It has nothing to do with my works or sacraments or anything. And, and there's a question in my mind, did I do the right thing? Because Catholics would tell me, if you don't stick with the Catholic Church, you're going to lose your salvation and go to hell. And I thought, boy, if I made the wrong decision, I'm going to hell. And so I had to, you know, wrestle with that thought. And then finally I realized the Bible has to be true. It's the same Bible that the Catholics use. So either it's true or it's not. And I had to come by faith to God and say, I believe by faith, Lord, that what you have written is true and I have to believe it with all my heart. And so I, I broke away from that thought and now I had that rest and that peace that, that what I believed in new, as new as it is, was true so well enough talking let's get into the scriptures now so we read it so paul goes on and says therefore now again you have to go back to chapter three and that was a while ago when we went through it so you'll have to read back and get the reason why he's saying therefore since a promise remains of entering his rest let us fear at least any of you seem to have come short of it so there are those who come short of the rest of god the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. They never enter into that rest. They never have that rest. They never have that faith. They never have that peace. They're short of it. He says, For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. And now he's pointing back to the children of Israel as they wandered in the wilderness. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest as he has said. So I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest. Although the works were finished from the foundations of the world. And so there is a rest that God has given to us. And it has been finished through Jesus Christ. Dying on the cross. Resurrecting from the dead. Ascending into heaven. Sitting at the right hand of the Father. There's a rest and a peace there that God has for us. Knowing that this earth is temporal. We're sojourners. This isn't our home. But we have to go through these sufferings. As Christ went through these sufferings too. And then we will be in rest when we get to heaven. Now, they didn't mix it with faith. And, and most of our walk is going to be of faith. There, there's just no getting around that. There are going to be things that we don't understand, things that we hope to understand, but it's all going to be done by faith. I don't know why God is doing it this way. I don't know why he's heading in that direction. I don't know why this is happening, but it all has to be done by faith. I'm learning that more and more that it has nothing to do with me. Read the book of Job. It's, if you're going to read Job, it's a, it's a long book, 40, 40 chapters, but um, don't read this, the, the middle of it. I'm, read it 
if you get time, but if you really want to just grasp what Job is saying and then what God says to him, read the first two chapters of what happened in Job's life, and then go all the way to what chapter 38, and where God then speaks to him. In between is his friends, you know, figuring out why he's going through the things he's going through. And okay, and just like anybody, when you're going through something and people come up to you, oh, it's because of this, and you're like, how do you know? They don't know, <laughs> you know, and, and we don't know. And so then God tells Job, he doesn't really even tell Job why. He just says, where were you, Job, when I created the heavens and the earth? Were you there when I created the firmament and the idea? Were you there when I created Leviathan? And he just starts telling him, where were you, Job? In other words, Job, who are you <laughs> to tell me, God, who created everything, what I'm doing? You're just to trust in me. And Job just like shut his mouth. Who am I to even respond to you, Lord? And he said, and, and then God then restored it later on to him. And he never knew why. He never knew why. But there was a point in Job's life where he had to just shut up. Because God is God. He's supreme. He knows what he's doing. He's above all things. We weren't there when he created the atom or the neutron or all the elements and how they came together, the sun, the universe. We weren't there. We're not God. And there's a point of faith there, right? Where you just have to trust God by faith that he's working things out, even though it looks dim. Even though it looks like you're right at the fiery furnace and that God's ready to allow you to get thrown in there, you have to have faith in God. Mixing with faith. And so that's important. Verse 4. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this place, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains that some must enter it. And those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience, again he designated a certain day, saying to in David, saying in David, today after such a long time, as it has been said, today if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Okay, so again, the children of Israel, they hardened their hearts. They didn't go into the promised land as God said it is yours, but they wouldn't do it because they didn't mix the faith with it. And so they wandered and they did not enter into the promised land. Their hearts were hardened. Uh, from entering in. For if Joshua, verse 8, had given them rest, then he would not afterwards have spoken of another day. Now, what does he mean there? Well, again, the Old Testament is speaking of the Messiah who is coming, not the Messiah who came. Their faith is in Jesus who, who is coming in the future. We're going to see that on Wednesday. Uh, the rock who is Christ, Paul says, so he interprets numbers for us and tells us that the rock is Jesus Christ. Actually, we'll see it on Sunday. Uh, he'll interpret that rock, the living water that came forth and gave Israel the water and so forth. He said, that's Christ. And that's who the Old Testament believers believed it was. It was the Messiah that represent the Messiah. And so they put their faith in God through that Messiah that would come in the future. And that is what saved them. And that rock went with them. And there's question, did the rock literally go with them through the wilderness? Or was it the water that went through the wilderness? Or did they carry the water through the wilderness? But we'll talk about that on Sunday. Mm -hmm. Interesting stuff. So, again, they didn't enter in. They were disobedient. They had a hardened heart. So that tells us one thing, and we need to be careful here. We need to have faith. So that's one thing that we need to have as believers. We just have to trust God. Simple. Trust, cling to Him. Just like a child who doesn't understand life, but he clings to his mama. Uh, he doesn't understand everything. When a mom says, don't go over there, you know, and the child gets upset and starts crying because they want to go over there, but you know he's going to get in trouble, he's going to get hurt. So you just hang on to him. So let God do that. You have to have faith as a Christian. You cannot be disobedient. You have to continue to walk with him, serve him faithfully, faithfully. Walking with him no matter what happens, what, no matter what happens. I got a compliment this morning, um, and it was really encouraging. I, I saw someone at the gym <clears throat> this morning that, that was coming here, and um, they welcomed me back because they knew I had gone to Africa. Uh, and they, they says, you know, I just want you to know that what you're doing there at the church is amazing. He said, I've known a lot of pastors and and people, and I tell you, you sacrifice a lot. I can see it in you and what you do. I see the love you have for the people. I see the sacrifice. I see your commitment. I see your fruit of it all. And I'm like, wow. 
And I was really encouraged through that. Because again, it feels like I'm not doing anything, that everything is falling down instead of being fruitful. But this person saw that. And I'm like, well, I'm not always faithful. And they're like, well, I know that. But compared to people I've known, you are a selfless person. You know, and I'm like, wow. And that was so encouraging because I've never seen him there at the gym before. But that's persevering. That is staying on course. That is trusting God by faith no matter what is going. You might be sinking in sand, but you're like still trying to walk forward with the Lord. And that's hanging on to his garment in a sense, uh, knowing that there's no other garment that we can hang on to. Verse 10, for he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his work as God did from his. And so he's speaking spiritually here, right? We don't have to work for our salvation. We know that it's set already through Jesus Christ. And so the works that we do are works of love and adoration towards God. We're not trying to gain anything from the Lord by what we do. So there's a rest there too. There's a real peace there that I'm not striving that hopefully you'll be uh, happy with me, God, you know, because I've done this, God, so bless me here, God. No, you don't have to do that. God's already blessed you. He's already given you that rest, and we can rest there. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall after the same example of disobedience, that is the children of Israel. For the word of the Lord is living, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and spirit, and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Amen. That's why it's important to read your word. Yes. That's why it's important to get up in the morning and have your devotion. So it is the word of God that is going through like a reverse osmosis, removing the contaminants. And so when you read uh, 1 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verse 15, like Paul said, whom I am the chief of sinners. I mean, that just ministers to me. It puts me back into my place. I'm nobody. I'm just a servant of the Lord. And I just have to be faithful with what God has given me because I'm worse than anyone else. And Paul is saying before and foremost, I'm the chief. Before anyone else is, is a sinner, I am the chief of sinners. He considered himself. And for me, that's encouraging because Paul went on to do some great works of selfless works that it, he knew it wasn't about him. He even knew there was a point where Paul said, man, to, to be absent from the body is present with the Lord. You know why he said that? Because he wanted to go home to be with the Lord. And that was selfishness. And that's why he said, but it's for your advantage that I stay. So he knew I have to stay with you guys and I have to be an example and I have to show you how to walk. I have to teach you. I have to lead you to Christ, not to myself. And so for your advantage, I'm staying. That's God's will. And his will for Paul was to suffer much, right? He yes. told him that at the very beginning. Paul, I've called you to suffer much in my name because Paul caused a lot of suffering in people's lives, I believe. So the word of God is powerful. It, it, it gets into thoughts. And if we allow it to and really read it with the spirit of God in our hearts, it will convict us. It will correct us. It will discipline us. But also it should encourage us. And there is no creature hidden from his sight. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Not one creature is hidden from God. He sees it all. But all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom he we must give an account. He knows our very hearts. He knows our nakedness. He knows our very thoughts. He knows our thoughts before we even formulate them and think them. And yet we walk around sometimes trying to hide things from him. <laughs> like if we could hide things from him, you know? When you're a little kid, sometimes uh, if you remember playing hide and seek, and if you play with little kids, they'll sometimes run around and they'll like, go. Oh, in a little corner and put their eyes there, hide. But you can see them and they're like, you can't, you know, they're like, they're supposed to be hiding. But you like, you're right there, I see you. But to them, they're hiding, you know, and you can't see them or their legs will be sticking out from under the bed, you know, and they think they're hiding. That's how we are sometimes with our own sins. Instead of just confessing it and fessing up and saying, man, God, I am, I'm a bad person. I'm a sinful person, Lord. And I sin every single day. My thoughts are bad and wicked every single day, Lord. And so I need you more and more. I don't 
stay in that place of sinfulness or, or the stay in that place of thinking how bad I am. I just say, Lord, that's still who I am, but I'm going to serve you then. As much as I sin, I'm going to serve you just as much. And Paul said in Romans, right, that the flesh, that flesh battles with the spirit. So there's two persons. And the, spirit, the spiritual person is different than the fleshly person. That fleshly person you're to murder and crucify. And so you're to ignore him. That's your old man. That's not who you are anymore. You're a new man. So you give into the new spirit and you walk in the spirit. And when that old man's head uh, is, is showing, you, you knock it off. You, know? you don't give into it and you keep walking in the spiritual man. That man is going to be there with you always. So you just ignore him. But I sin, but I go through this. Yeah, but ignore it. That's not you anymore. You're the spiritual man that Paul's talking about. So walk in that new man and just confess those sins and meet, keep moving forward. Like water off a duck's back. It just goes on and you just keep going forward. And this is, uh, so nothing's hidden from him, it says. Let's close up. Seeing then that we have such a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, confessed I'm sorry, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Mm. Isn't that amazing? Yes. That Jesus understands everything we go through. He understands abandonment. He understands hate. He understands lust. He understands every temptation imaginable to a human being. He understands laziness. He understands it all. He's been tempted in every point. So there's nothing that he doesn't understand. So there's no human being that he doesn't understand. He knows it all. And yet he never sinned. He never gave in to it. That was the flesh. That was the fleshly, earthly man of Jesus. But he never gave in to it. It would reel itself. Remember in the garden? Yes. Lord, Father... Daddy, <laughs> this cup that you want me to take, I don't want to take of it. Is there any way to do it another way? Any way, Lord, take it from me, please. And he was sweating drops of blood. That's how stressful in, in prayer he was. But then he didn't give in to that, right? He said, not my will, your will be done. And he walked that walk. He could have walked the other walk and walked away and said, no, I'm just going to go get a family and live in Israel somewhere in a cave. You know, if you find some other way. And that's what a lot of us do. We end up walking that walk in the flesh instead of following after the spiritual man. Is it hard? Yes. It's denying of self. But we have a priest that understands. Therefore, look at verse 16, and it's awesome. Let us, that is all of us, therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace in help in time of need. Because it's not easy, Paul says, look, we all have the flesh. Jesus Christ had the flesh, but he didn't give in to it. We give in to it, but that's why we can come boldly to the throne room of God because of the blood of Jesus Christ. He's opened up the doors that we can come straight to God and say, God, help me. I'm in need. I need your strength. I'm naked before you. You know my sins. You know my struggles. And so there it is, Lord. So I need your help. Give me the strength to continue on in the spirit and not in the flesh. So today I hope that you will walk in the spirit Forget the walk in the flesh. Ignore that man. That's not who you are. And walk with God and do the right things. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for your precious word. May you encourage us, Lord, to walk in the spirit and not in the man. Though that man's with us, Lord God, and that man doesn't want to have rest, and that man wants to destroy itself, Lord, we can ignore him. We can crucify him and walk in the spirit, Lord, and find the rest in Jesus Christ that we should have, Father. We're praying that you help us to have the right perspective, the right mindset, the right heart, Lord, as we walk with Jesus, no matter what we go through, Lord. And I know there's so many in this church, Lord, because we reach those at the bottom of the barrel, Lord, those that are without, those that are homeless, those that are between jobs, those that don't have much, Lord, those that are struggling financially with their vehicles, with their relationships, Lord. Uh, we deal with all of that a hundred times more than any other church, Lord, because, Lord, we're reaching people that normally churches won't reach because there are no resources there. And so, Lord, we're depending on you, Lord, to help them, Father, because we don't have that resource to help them with, Lord. But, Lord, what we do have is you, and what we give to them is you, Lord. And so I pray, Lord, that you would fill in the gaps, Father, where we lack as a church, 
as human beings, Lord, and that you would meet the needs of your people, Lord, today. And Lord, they would find that rest in faith and in trust in you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today. If you have any prayer requests, post them or private message me and I will pray for you. Love you guys.